I'm reminded of a comic strip I once read, and it showed a dog, and the dog was drinking water out of a toilet bowl. And he looks up, and he says, you know, I'm a dog. I'm supposed to like drinking water out of a toilet bowl, but I really do like drinking water out of a toilet bowl. And authors are kind of like that dog. <laughs> We're supposed to be grateful to audiences like you for showing up, but I really am grateful. You have no idea. Uh, before we start, I, I have to have the confession. I do have a little cold tonight, so I might be making water trips or uh, turning around to clear my head. I apologize. Um, I do want to plug Town Hall. I've been a Town Hall member, as Katie said, for several years, and I urge you to join. I'm going to lift that up a little more. Town Hall performs an important function in our community, one that social media can't do. It exposes people to new ideas that you don't find on Facebook or aren't part of Google's algorithms. If we lose forums like town hall and libraries and newspapers, what we're left with is a society that has no aids to help us differentiate between opinion and fact. People without the skills to analyze what's happening in our world. David Brewster wasn't able to be here tonight but I also want to call him out. David has shown what one person can do. David founded not just only Town Hall here, but he also founded the weekly, Crosscut.com, and his latest endeavor, Folio, the Seattle Athenaeum. The greatest tribute we can give David is to borrow that given to the great 18th century architect Christopher Wren. If you seek his monument, look around you. I'd also like to plug independent bookstores like our friends Elliott Bay, which is selling the book tonight. Indies like Elliott Bay and Queen Anne Books and Third Place, among others, ensure a healthy publishing industry and a diversity of voices. And while everyone, including myself, has bought from Amazon, its move into brick and mortar bookstores are totally based on algorithms and don't expose people to quirky ideas or for that matter, quirky people like me. Before I start telling some stories about the revolution, I want to ask the question, why should we care? Why should we care what a bunch of old dead men 235 years ago did? What possible relevance is the American Revolution to us today? The revolution seems so remote from our wars today. Although the revolutionary generation didn't have an atomic bomb and they didn't have chemical weapons, they certainly faced some of the challenges we face today. They used biological weapons in the form of smallpox. They used terrorist tactics, including torture and indiscriminate warfare against civilians. There was overt racism and ethnic cleansing and support of genocide. The sheer brutality of the revolution matches the brutality that we see today. So what do the lessons of history teach? If you want to be truthful, nothing specific. But there are some lessons, and you'll see those reflected in the stories I'm going to tell. First, the winners of wars believe that their biases are facts. An honest approach to history can help us do what our proverbial ninth grade history teacher didn't do, teach us how to distinguish between fact and opinion. We all say sarcastically that if it's on the internet, it must be true, but then huge numbers of people do believe what they see on the internet. Whether it's that Barack Obama is a Muslim from Kenya, or that Donald Trump's grandfather made his fortune as a pimp and drug dealer, or that all of our founders opposed taxes and our founders opposed a strong federal government. When President Obama was forced for political reasons to talk about American exceptionalism, he was attacked for saying 
every country is exceptional in its own way. Critics accused him of denying the heart and soul of this nation. John Adams, a founding father, would have been pilloried because of what he believed. John Adams, there is no special providence for us. We are not chosen people that I know of. The second thing we can learn from history is that Simplicity isn't necessarily a virtue. Complexity and nuance, shades of gray, are ever-present. We can learn that understanding an enemy's perspective doesn't impugn one's patriotism. And as historian Margaret Macmillan said, we can learn humility and skepticism. So now, let's challenge some American myths with a quick review of the revolution and some different perspectives that our ninth grade history teacher might not have told us. The revolution, of course, was the war with Washington, Jefferson, Franklin, and Hamilton, but not Abe Lincoln. Abe Lincoln came along four score and seven years later. I'm going to call Washington and his colleagues rebels, or as they sometimes called themselves, Whigs. I'm not going to call them patriots because loyalists and Native Americans were just as patriotic in their own way and just as American. And as Seahawks fans can attest, just because you call yourself a patriot doesn't mean you're a hero. From the rebel perspective, the British taxed them without representation. They interfered with free trade. They mollycoddled Catholics, or as the rebels referred to them, papists. The, and from the rebel perspective, the Brits stopped pioneers from settling the frontier and limited the potential for real estate investments and commerce. The Brits, of course, saw it differently. They saw terrorism and torture, freeloading colonists refusing to pay for their own defense, rampant illegal smuggling and trading with enemies, disrespect for private property, disrespect for law and order, and stealing land from sovereign Indian nations with whom the British had signed solemn sacred treaties. The insurgents used social media, including the 18th century equivalent of Facebook and Instagram, to attract people to their cause. The rebels were brilliant propagandists. Some of their social media tools were propaganda pictures, I'm sorry, I went one too far, were propaganda pictures like these. Uh, this is the Boston so-called massacre. Pamphlets and the innovative committees of correspondence. Now, we all know that the war began in Lexington and Concord, Massachusetts, when rebels resisted British troops who were on a mission to capture terrorists and seize their weapons of mass destruction. The rebels chose Washington as their commander. Now, we all know the picture of Washington on the $1 bill. He looks like our grandma. <laughs> but he was really a tough hombre, both physically and mentally. He lost too many battles to be considered a great strategic general, but he was arguably the most brilliant political general of our time, of all time for that matter. His surprise attacks on Trenton and Princeton, New Jersey, rank right up there with the North Vietnamese Tet Offensive during the Vietnam War as important political victories. Washington was also a great judge of talent and had enough self-assurance that he didn't feel threatened to surround himself with people who were a lot smarter than he was. He was also a great land speculator, one of the great land speculators in American history, probably greater than Donald Trump. He mostly used his wife's money, or to paraphrase our friend John Adams, would Washington have ever been commander of the Revolutionary Army if he had not married a rich widow? This is Martha, of course. Washington didn't win the rebels' first major military victory. 
That honor belonged to a Connecticut pharmacist, bookseller, and merchant who found his niche as a brilliant and inspirational general. Of course, I'm talking about Benedict Arnold, a true American hero before he switched sides. Arnold's won a great victory at Saratoga, New York, and with this great victory, France and later Spain and Holland entered the war against the British. The revolution became a world war, and the map shows some of the locations around the world where the American Revolution was fought. In the South, one of Washington's mentees, an ironmonger and self-taught rebel general who never won a battle, forced a British army to retreat to Virginia. Nathaniel Green, we fight, get beat, rise, and fight again. Katie, Green's wife, was incredibly hot and smart. She attracted men, including Washington, wherever she went. It ran in the family. Ben Franklin, who was in love with Katie's aunt, was frustrated because Katie's aunt refused to sleep with him. Franklin, your favors come mixed with the snowy fleeces, which are as pure as your virgin innocence, white as your lovely bosoms, and as cold. <laughs> but I digress. We can talk more about Katie Green in the Q&A if you want. The main British army was in New York City, but the southern British army, forced into Virginia by Green, gave the American rebels and their French allies an opportunity. Now, going after the British in Virginia wasn't Washington's first choice. He obsessed about a joint French rebel attack against the British in New York City. But the French insisted that it was either Virginia or nothing. You've probably seen this famous picture of Cornwallis surrendering to Washington at Yorktown. It hangs in the US Capitol. Except it wasn't Cornwallis who surrendered the army. It was his second in command, Charles O'Hara, who you can see in the inset. And it wasn't Washington who received the surrender. It was Washington's second in command, Benjamin Lincoln. And O'Hara wasn't walking. He was on horseback. The British victory at Yorktown was a French victory. It was made possible by a French strategy, two French fleets, French siege engineers, French artillery that pounded the British, fought largely by French soldiers, Marines, and sailors who outnumbered their American rebels allies four to one. And it was set up by a French expatriate named Lafayette, who commanded a small rebel force that had shadowed the British army in Virginia all summer. During the siege, rebel troops captured one of the major British fortifications. The French took the other. It was a victory financed by French money that paid, armed, clothed, and propped up the rebels. And it was French diplomacy that ordered its commander-in-chief to publicly defer to Washington without overtly giving him any authority. But Washington, excuse me, Yorktown didn't mean the war was over. If anything, it meant the war expanded around the world as the British realized they couldn't defeat the rebels without first defeating the Allies. Now, I'm going to tell you some of these stories in a few minutes. I'm not going to be sequential, and I hope you won't get upset because I won't be throwing a lot of battles and dates and names out at you. But first, let's go back to the South. Although Cornwallis had surrendered at Yorktown, the Brits still held positions in Georgia and South Carolina and North Carolina. And the British general in charge was a guy named Alexander Leslie. I love Leslie. He was the Forrest Gump of the Revolution. He seemed to be everywhere. When he took command at Charlestown, South Carolina, we know the city today as Charleston, home of Boeing's non-union shop, Leslie was 51 and had been in the army since he was a teenager. 
Leslie's wife had died two decades before the revolution, just a year after giving birth to their only child, a girl. More on her later. In 1768, Was Leslie, I have Washington on my mind, in 1768, Leslie was assigned to the garrison in Boston. He stayed in America for the next 15 years, a fellow officer. Leslie is a genteel little man, lives well and drinks good claret. A female friend. He is an amiable and good man, the father of his choir and the soldiers, who all look up to him with respect and affection. Even a Boston newspaper publisher, who are hard to impress, conceded that Leslie was brave, sensible, and polite. But, of course, his relations with Boston didn't stay cordial. To use a Vietnam War analogy, it was white boots marching in a yellow land, although in this case, it was red coats marching in a land where you didn't know who your friend was and who your enemy was. Not unlike our current situation. In February 1775, Massachusetts residents loyal to the Crown reported to the British that anti-government insurgents were collecting those weapons of mass destruction, cannon, in a blacksmith's shop in Salem, a wealthy seaport about 5,000 people just north of the city. Now, we've all heard of Salem uh, because of the witch trials. The witch trials happened a couple of generations before. The witches were long gone. Leslie, then a colonel, was ordered to take 250 men and make a surprise raid to seize the cannon in Salem. Of course, if the rebels couldn't keep a secret about the cannon, the Brits couldn't keep a secret about 250 men headed to Salem. Suffice to say, there was a standoff. According to one rebel account, Leslie threatened to fire on the crowd which stood between him and the blacksmith shop, which was just past a bridge that spanned a river, the North River in Salem. There used to be a restaurant in Salem just across that North Bridge called Leslie's Retreat. We're at the standoff, a rebel. If you do fire, you will all be dead men. The rebel mob. Soldiers, red jackets, lobster coats, Cowards, damnation to your government. Fortunately, a loyalist clergyman arrived and mediated a compromise. The rebels would allow Leslie's men to cross the bridge to save their face. In the meantime, of course, they had already removed the cannon. The war would wait for 52 days. Leslie's career became a map of the war. He defended Boston against Washington. He led troops in New York and New Jersey. And as the war moved south, Leslie moved south. He was there when the British captured Savannah and, and Charlestown and led troops in Virginia. Now a general, he fought with Cornwallis in the Carolinas, but he was saved from the Yorktown debacle only because he was back in New York City, he had a major illness. After Yorktown, though, he commanded the remaining British troops in the South. His first job was to assess the situation for his superior in New York. He found a grim situation. Leslie, the whole of our country is against us, except for some helpless loyalist militia. Add to this the refugees to feed, clothe, and support. Many are destitute. I must get my heart steeled. It is a most unpleasant situation. Disease decimated both Leslie's troops and Nathaniel Green's rebel army. The South was a dictionary of 18th century horrors. Impure water, infection, vermin-infested clothes, malnutrition, heat exhaustion, rheumatic fever, jaundice, pneumonia, pleurisy, dysentery, smallpox, flu, venereal disease, typhus, scurvy, typhoid fever, tetanus, worms, scabies, malaria, and of course, yellow fever, the black vomit. Leslie's troops were outnumbered. 
especially after the rebels plundered loyalist plantations, including their slaves, and then offered three slaves for every new rebel recruit. Both Leslie and Green were shocked at the nature of the war in the South. Now, generals of that time expected brutality among what they called savages, what we call today Native Americans fighting for their homeland. But in the South, it was the whites who had become savages, a British officer. This country is in a glorious situation for cutting one's throats. Another officer, goths and vandals murdered every loyalist they found, whether in arms or at home. But for every horror story the loyalists told, there was a corresponding one told by the rebels. Green, with us, the difference between Whig and Tory is little more than a division of sentiment. But here, they persecute each other with little less than savage fury. John Marshall, a rebel soldier and the future Chief Justice of the United States, not a favorite of the Tea Party these days, summarized it this way. The war in the South was a war of extermination. This was not what Alexander Leslie had signed up for. He begged to be relieved of command. Leslie, from sickness and accidents, by falls and dislocations, my health is unfit to stand the summer. The perplexity of the problems related to loyalist civilians is so much beyond my abilities to arrange that I declare myself unequal to the task. From morning to night, I have memorials and petitions full of distress. My mother is going into her grave and only wishing to see me, my only daughter refuses to be married until I return. My country has got her full share of me. His commander shed crocodile tears. Tough luck, he told Leslie. You're, you stay for the duration. Leslie eventually evacuated more than 4,200 loyalist Americans and nearly 7,200 African Americans some of them slaves belonging to loyalists and officers, but most of them promised freedom in exchange for fighting for the British. Leslie, those who have voluntarily come in under the faith of our protection cannot, in justice, be abandoned to the merciless resentment of their former masters. We'll leave the South now and talk just briefly about some of the other theaters of war and a few of the heroes and goats. The war shifted to the Caribbean. The Caribbean was the great prize of the war. Um, it wasn't the colonies. And the Caribbean was where the money was. The equivalent of late 20th century oil money, except their oil was sugar. The French and the Spanish might actually have kicked the British completely out of the Caribbean had it not been for one greedy, anti-Semitic British admiral named George Rodney. Rodney was in the process actually of being recalled for embezzlement, but won an enormous naval victory against the French before his recall orders arrived. When he did return to Britain, he returned as a national hero and all was forgiven. Rodney's second in command, Samuel Hood, after whom Mount Hood was named in Oregon, sent endless complaints about Rodney to London. Hood. Rodney requires a monitor perpetually at his elbow as much as a froward child. There is, I'm sorry to say, no great reliance to be placed in a man who is so much governed by whim and caprice. Now, I alluded to Spain, which ruled North America west of the Mississippi. Spain didn't really want to enter the war, largely because it didn't trust American rebels, because Spain saw how the American rebels had invaded Indian territory, and they were afraid that they would be next if Britain didn't win. But the French said, we'll take 
Gibraltar from the British and give it back to you. Spain had a right to be concerned about an invasion from the rebels. It's just that it was a generation later and Andrew Jackson, who's on our $20 bill, who led the invasion. Gibraltar brought Spain into the war. Um, France said, we're not going to end the war until we give you back Gibraltar. The, the, Spain hated the British presence in Gibraltar, which is on the Spanish mainland. It was a thorn in Spain's side then, and it's still a thorn in Spain's side. This is Spanish propaganda picture from just a couple of years ago. Um, no, the um, Spanish in the 18th century did not have fighter jets. French and Spanish army and navies besieged the Brits at Gibraltar. Everybody's familiar with Gibraltar, the Rock of Gibraltar, uh, uh, one of the Prudential Insurance used to have it as their logo. The British were really well entrenched there. A French engineer came up with some amazing new technology, wooden chips that wouldn't burn if struck by British cannon. But these amazing new tech, British, uh, Spanish and French ships were so heavily armed that they would be able to destroy the British fortifications in Gibraltar. And this new technology worked for about a day. Then the ships burned to a crisp. Meanwhile, the British defense at Gibraltar held, just as it did during World War II. The British general, George Augustus Eliot, had, as they say, a personality. And I might add, he is not the same Eliot that they named Eliot Bay after. That was a different Eliot. A colleague. Eliot is singular and austere in his manner. Others called him sour and intractable. He never ate meat. He never drank strong liquor. He lived chiefly on vegetables, puddings, and water. He was a strict disciplinarian. He even ordered soldiers' wives flogged for buying stolen goods. His officers chafed under him. To discourage his officers from drinking, he taxed liquor. But unlike the overtly anti-Semitic Admiral Rodney, Eliot treated everyone fairly under the law. Once, he even punished some officers who beat up two Jews to whom they owed money. At Gibraltar, he was the right man at the right time. Let's now move to the North American frontier. For years before the war, Indian nations complained to colonial governments about incursions by white land thieves, who we call the pioneers. Not much came from the Indians' peaceful protests, although the British did try to stem the flow of land thieves and speculators. They made a good faith attempt. When the revolution broke out, most Indian nations sided with the British, thinking the enemy of my enemy is my friend. The war on the frontier was just as vicious as the war in the South. In what's now Ohio, Rebel militia massacred 90 pacifist Christian Indian men, women, and children. The rebels offered bounties for Indian scalps. And although Indians rarely, if ever, raped rebel women, the same couldn't be said for rebel militias and Indian women. In turn, Indians and loyalists devastated Kentucky. They invaded rebel territory in upstate New York, 10 miles from where I was born. They famously tortured to death one of Washington's land agents. They destroyed an invading militia force led in part by Daniel Boone. In fact, the last battle of the American Revolution that was fought on North American soil was on the frontier in Arkansas. This is roughly where they fought the battle. There, 
Spanish and Quapaw Nation troops clashed with Loyalist and Chickasaw Nation troops. The Loyalists and Chickasaws were led by an American Loyalist who had married into the tribe. If the British had won the war, the exploits of James Logan Colbert would be as celebrated today as those of the Swamp Fox or Mad Anthony Wayne or Washington. The Spanish never defeated him. He wrecked havoc on Spanish commerce along the Mississippi. He kidnapped the wife of a Spanish commander, then released her on faith that the Spanish would release some loyalist prisoners. And he attacked a Spanish post 100 miles from what is now Little Rock. It's now Arkansas Post National Memorial, which is what this is an aerial view of. Colbert was a um, successful trader. He owned 150 African-American slaves. And as one Spanish officer described him, he was insolent, ironic, and contemptuous. But Colbert's last fight in May 1783 wasn't the last battle of the American Revolution. That battle was in India. The French presence in India was anemic, and its native ally, the, a Muslim, Haider Ali, was frustrated by France's lack of effort. Ali was one of the best generals of the war, and his efforts against the British were so famous that Philadelphia merchants, who fitted out a small armed naval ship, named their ship after their Muslim co-belligerent. A British official, Hyder's bold, an original and enterprising commander, skillful in tactics and fertile in resources, full of energy and never desponding in defeat. A British general, even when I forced Hyder to retreat, there was no consternation on his part, no trophies on ours. This is the most accurate picture of him. He once explained to a British official that he shaved his eyebrows, his hair, and his face because he didn't want anyone in his kingdom to look like him. Some accused him of murdering thousands of unarmed Indians in cold blood. Others praised his government, which he turned into a meritocracy, a British army chaplain. What religion people profess, or whether they profess any at all, that is perfectly indifferent to him. It's a far cry from the traditional Muslim-Hindu conflicts that haunt India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh to this day. Like the French engineer at Gibraltar, Hyder used advanced weaponry. In this case, it was long-range rockets launched from bamboo tubes lined with iron. But his ostensible ally, the French, couldn't get their act together for joint operations. That changed with the assignment to India of a French seaman, his crews nicknamed Admiral Satan. Pierre-André de Suffren, Suffren as we Americans pronounce it, was a nasty, demanding, egotistical naval genius with a lust for action. He was an unlikely looking man of action, a British traveler. He looked much more like a little fat, vulgar English butler than a Frenchman of consequence, very corpulent. He was in slippers, or rather a pair of old shoes, the straps being cut off, blue cloth breeches unbuttoned at their knees, cotton or thread stockings, none of the cleanest, hanging about his legs, no waistcoat or cravat, a coarse linen shirt entirely wet with perspiration, open at the neck, the sleeves being rolled up above his elbows as if he was going to wash his hands and arms. Despite his obesity, Suffren is as quick and as light as any midshipman. He fought five major battles off the coast of India and what is now Sri Lanka and he fought them to either a draw or a victory. After one battle, he met and strategized with Hyder and did what any ally should do, cooperate. Hyder, 
at last the English have found their master. Here is the man who will help me exterminate them. Hyder was also impressed by Suffren's capacity to inhale spicy Indian food. Suffren was equally enthusiastic about Hyder. Suffren, if we had known how to deal with him from the start, we could have had him do anything we wanted. My only cunning in dealing with him was to use none and to tell him always what was strictly true. Sadly for the French and Mysoreans, Hyder died from natural causes before the last of Suffren's five great battles. That last battle started on British terms. The British surrounded a French army in the town of Cuddalore on the southeast Indian coast. They were blockaded by the French Navy, or excuse me, by the British Navy on the sea and besieged by a British army on the land side. Suffren attacked the British fleet, which fled in defeat. It was one of the largest naval battles ever fought in the Indian Ocean then or now. The British army, however, on the land, slide, land side held on. The French attacked the British in the wee hours of June 25th, 1783. It was a disaster for the French. And it was the last battle of the American Revolution. As Suffren was preparing for a new offensive, a British ship appeared in the distance. It showed a white flag. It brought the news that a peace treaty had been signed in Paris five months before. The fighting was over. Suffren died in Paris five years later, probably from a heart attack while eating dinner. His corpse was dug up during the French Revolution and scattered. Seven Navy ships have been named after Suffren, as well as an avenue in Paris and at least one bar, restaurant, and hotel. Although the last battle of the revolution was in June 1783, there was still a British army in New York City. Washington's counterpart was a British general named Guy Carleton, who at the age of 58 was about eight years, young, eight years older than Washington, the prime minister. He is so much of a soldier and so little of a politician, such a resolute, honest man and such a faithful and dutiful subject an officer. He is one of the most distant, reserved men in the world. He has a rigid strictness in his manner, very unpleasing. King George. Carlton is too cold and not as active as might be wished, but his uncorruptness is universally acknowledged. Like his subordinate, General Lee, excuse me, General Leslie in Charlestown, Carleton's first assessment of the situation in New York wasn't encouraging. He had few transport ships and the large loyalist and refugee population had been oppressed by the British Army. Admiral Rodney had called that British Army in New York a long train of leeches. Washington and his rebels also frustrated Carleton. Washington insisted that he could make no decisions about what could be defined as civil matters. Carleton asked him for clarification. Carleton, am I, sir, to apply to Congress that persons appointed by me may be admitted to conferences in Philadelphia? Or can any deputation be sent by Congress here to your camp for this purpose? Or will you undertake to manage our common interest? All I wish for is an end in which our common honor and humanity is engaged may be substantially obtained. He shared Leslie's frustration. Leslie once complained that he couldn't negotiate a prisoner exchange because Nathaniel Green was, and I apologize to the lawyers here, Nathaniel Green said, Leslie said Nathaniel Green was, quote, a regular lawyer. <laughs>
After Carleton publicly announced that Britain would evacuate New York, the Loyalists were devastated, angry, and incredulous. At the same time, the American Whigs began wholesale persecution of Loyalists who were outside the city proper. Carleton. Almost all those who have attempted to return to their homes have been exceedingly ill-treated, many beaten, robbed of their money and clothing, and sent back. This is the shedding of American blood by American hands. One loyalist in Connecticut said he was nearly hanged by the neck, then stripped, whipped, tarred, feathered, and put on public display. Then he was deported to the city. One of the friction points between Carleton and Washington was African Americans. Carleton told Washington that he had begun a register of blacks, the so-called Book of Negroes, to determine which former slaves should be evacuated. This, I'm sorry, this is what the Book of Negroes looked like. Um, they, the top um, first column says Negroes' names, the second one is age, the third is description, there were several other columns involved. When We can come back to that if you want. Um, when Washington heard what Carleton was doing, Washington absolutely went ballistic. He wanted all escaped slaves returned, not evacuated. Carleton refused to back down. Carleton, I had no right to deprive them of that liberty I found them possessed of. Eventually, throughout the United States, the British preserved the freedom of upwards of 20,000 former slaves. An unknown number of thousands of others escaped on their own. Around noon on November 21st, 1783, the last of 35,000 Loyalist refugees and 20,000 British soldiers left New York. On December 4th, Staten Island residents stood on a bank overlooking the Narrows, the site of today's Verrazano Narrows Bridge. The Narrows is the channel through which the British fleet sailed from New York Harbor to the ocean. An eyewitness. We were very boisterous in our demonstration of joy. We clapped our hands, we waved our hats, we sprang into the air. A few others indulged in gestures which, though very expressive, were neither polite nor judicious. A few rods from us stood another group, composed of men and women who gazed silently and some tearfully upon the passing ships. For some of the females had lovers and some husbands on board of them who were leaving them behind, never probably to see them again. I have lots of neat stuff on my website, including some of the filthiest political cartoons you've ever seen <laughs> from the 18th century. I also have a page where I have a short list of corrections and clarifications, mea culpa. And there's also a page of portraits of probably 80% of the people who I write about in the book. Thank you very much. And now I look forward to your comments and questions. Thank you. Now, now I'll please the flight attendant. There are two mics, unless you want to And I apologize because of my cold. I might have to ask you to repeat them. So how do you apply all of this to the wars of today and how to possibly stop the wars of today? I think the important thing is to separate fact from opinion, to not get wrapped 
to not wrap ourselves up in the flag so much that it blinds us, to have humility, to be skeptical. Um, you know, one might say that the terror during the French Revolution was supported by the population, even though it was indiscriminate killing. We need to look at the terrorists today and understand them. It doesn't excuse the brutality, but if we just, as some candidates have said, we'll just carpet bomb them, that's not separating fact from fiction. It's not looking at it critically. Um, it's not putting ourselves in our enemy's shoes. We don't have to be sympathetic to them, but um, we should try and understand them better and less with the rhetoric. You want that, that mic? Okay. Hello, Don. Um, you mentioned uh, the role of the French, uh, very broad shoulders in terms of uh, aid to the uh, rebels. Uh, they were involved themselves with the little revolution. They were. Shortly perspective I'm not sure all the money they the French poured down the North American rat hole would have been used to alleviate the woes of the population in France um, but it's I think it's fair to say that we helped bankrupt the royal government in France and um, France supplied us with arms and ammunition and money even before they came into the war. A lot of the, some of the cannon that um, the British were trying to capture at the time of Lexington and Concord um, had found its way from the Caribbean and French colonies in the Caribbean and paid for with French money. Um, and during the French Revolution, of course, um, America, the then United States, had a lot of mixed emotions. Um, and it was an open question of whether we would go to declare a formal war with France. We were already fighting revolutionary France, the so-called quasi-war, or spend our time going to war with Britain. Uh, John Adams was able to turn the population against the French revolutionary government, the XYZ affair, for those who want to look it up. Um, and uh, James Madison got us involved in the War of 1812 for the British. Um, everything is shades of gray. How were, the, how were the British and French troops supported with food stores and were they just absconding as they went? The um, British controlled a lot of the ocean. So they got supplies from the Caribbean. Uh, they got some other supplies from Europe, but mostly the British had money. And much to Washington's frustration, the British paid fair price for goods that rebels smuggled across the lines. Um, and of course, there were parts of America that were just devastated from foraging by, by all the armies. Um, parts of Westchester County in New York. Um, th there's one description about the time that, that Washington and Carleton were negotiating the evacuation, and one description of people living in Westchester, and it said, these are people who are comatose. They sit in their houses and they don't say anything. They're shell-shocked. They've tried to hide their food. There is no food. There are accounts of, of the devastation in the South where plantations were plundered. Um, 
cows taken. In fact, the, one of the last battles of the revolution in the South um, occurred when a British foraging uh, force um, stole a bunch of cows and, and was trying to steal rice, and they ran into um, a part of Nathaniel Green's force. And um, maybe I should talk a little bit about um, uh, John Lawrence. Um, John Lawrence was Washington's aide. He was a young guy. He was best friends with Hamilton. There are some modern scholars who say that John Lawrence and Hamilton might have had a, um, a homosexual affair together. Uh, others, and Ron Chernow, who was here in Seattle, who wrote the great biography of Alexander Hamilton, said, when John Lawrence died, a spark went out of Hamilton's correspondence. Um, John Lawrence was involved in one of those last battles because John Lawrence won a glory. And he had a force of about 50 men. And as this British expeditionary foraging force, about 500, came down the Cumbee River in South Carolina, he started firing a cannon at them. The British went to shore, and instead of fleeing with his little force of 50 men, he attacked this force of 500. Needless to say, he was killed. Um, Washington later described it as a piddling little affair. Um, and uh, so to answer your question, lots of foraging. The British paid cash. The French also paid cash. And, um, and there was a lot of theft and a lot of contraband. The, earlier in the presentation, you mentioned the woman. Did you want to ex uh, elaborate on, you said, ask me in the Q&A, oh, did you want to Katie elaborate Katie Green. Her? I'm in love with Katie Green, as everyone was, every man was. Um, some of the women were not so thrilled with Katie being a male magnet. Um, one woman said, every time she comes into the room, I hear the clang, clang, clang of an ironmonger's mistress, uh, because Nathaniel Green was an ironmonger. Um, Katie, a after the war, um, Katie and Nathaniel were given a plantation by the Georgia state government, and thanks for everything Nathaniel Green did in terms of kicking the British out. And uh, Nathaniel died tragically, uh, probably from a heat stroke at the age of 41. Um, Katie was alone. Her next door neighbor, the plantation down, who had also been given an award of a plantation, was General Mad Anthony Wayne, a great American general. Wayne, of course, was married. Uh, it was an unhappy marriage. His wife was back in his hometown of Pennsylvania. So, of course, when Nathaniel died, he proposed to um, Katie. Uh, Katie wouldn't have anything of it. She ended up marrying her kid's tutor. And the interesting thing is the tutor's business partner was a guy named Eli Whitney. And Katie was an early venture capitalist, and some of Katie's money went to fund Eli Whitney's cotton gin. Um, there are some scholars who say that Katie actually contributed to some of the ideas that Whitney had, that Whitney was demonstrating his model, and Katie said, well, why don't you do this? And Whitney did, oh. Who knows? Some scholars debate that. But um, Katie and her um, second husband um, lived a long and happy marriage, and they're buried on Cumberland Island in Georgia. <laughs>
So you mentioned earlier that the uh, French contribution uh, was extremely large. What, what was in it for the French? What was their strategic goal? Was it mainly the Caribbean, or did they just not like the English? The French and the British had fought about 30 wars from the Middle Ages on. Uh, one would win one more, or another would win one more. In, um, in the 18th century, uh, the, the war immediately preceding the revolution was the Seven Years' War, which we call the French and Indian War. Before that, there was another war, and another war, and another war. In the French and Indian War, the Seven Years' War, the French got kicked out of North America, save for the little island of saint pierre and miquelon off the coast of Newfoundland, which they were able to negotiate as a fishing port. If the French could be assured that this um, rebel American army was a real thing, then maybe the French could get North America back. Plus the Caribbean, um, the French had, the, the history of the different islands in the Caribbean is the same kind of history. One year they'd take one island, the next year they'd take another island. In between there were the Danes and, and, and the Dutch, and, um, and maybe this was a chance to take some of the richer islands in the Caribbean. Maybe the French could take Jamaica. And if it hadn't been for Admiral Rodney at the Battle of the Saints, it's highly likely that the French and Spanish might have taken Jamaica, which was as much of a prize as Guadeloupe. But the Caribbean supplied some ungodly percentage of revenue to France. Uh, it was like one third of their revenue. So the French had a lot to gain. And if it hadn't been for the peace treaty, Admiral Suffren, Admiral Satan, might have taken most of India from the British. They gambled. And um, the French were, the French were highly displeased that Ben Franklin and John Adams made in essence a separate peace treaty. They were amazed at the concessions that the British gave to Franklin and, and the rebels um, because the French wanted to negotiate the treaty for everybody. And if they had, it, um, it would have been a different story because the French really didn't care about the United States. <laughs> um, interestingly, after Franklin negotiated the separate treaty, he sent a letter of apology to the foreign minister in France, of France, saying, gee, you know, none of this will take effect until you sign your own treaty. Um, you know, this just happened, I'm sorry. And, oh, by the way, can you give us another loan? <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. I'm curious oh, about hi, you. Tim. <laughs> I'm curious about your own history. How did you get started on this? How did I get started on this? I was raised in the Mohawk Valley of upstate New York. And the revolution was all around me. My family came from Boston. Um, the newspaper that I grew up with, when there were newspapers, uh, with the Schenectady Union Star, back then, they didn't have offset printing. They had hot lead and with linotype machines. And they'd do up a column, and then they'd transfer it, and they'd make a metal mold, and they'd run it off the machine. And sometimes the columns didn't fit the entire column. So they had little things called fillers. And these fillers were trivia, essentially. And one filler that I saw that just kept with me that said, inaccurately, I might add. The last battle of the American Revolution was in September 1782 at Fort Henry, Virginia. Well, that was inaccurate, but that little thing stuck with me. Plus, I just grew up with a revolution in Boston and upstate New York, and um, 
there are two kinds of people in the world. There are Civil War people and there are Revolution people. <laughs> there are Washington people and there are Lincoln people. There was no Civil War in Boston. I was a Washington person. Yes, sir. Uh, could you answer a Civil War question, perhaps? I can try. <laughs> Um, I, I've, I've heard one fellow say that Sherman's march to the sea was uh, unnecessary strategically, that it was a, um, uh, a march of revenge and uh, burnt earth, um, and that <clears throat> um, the amount of raping and pillaging that went on was horrendous, uh, that it was totally uncalled for, basically. But in school, we grew up with the idea, with hearing that Sherman was this big hero that, that basically took the heart out of um, the South and um, began the end of the Civil War. What, what, what thought might you have on that? Not much. <laughs> All I know about the Civil War, I learned from C-SPAN and from um, a biography of William Seward, whose statue is in Volunteer Park, uh, written by Walter Starr, who very kindly um, said nice things about my book. Uh, the one thing I remember from the C-SPAN episode is that um, Sherman lost the war of Southern revisionist propaganda, but I am no expert on Sherman. Well, what did he mean by Sherman, Southern revisionist propaganda? That Sherman was actually fairly moderate in what he did, and um, it was a very controlled um, um, action, mm -hmm. unlike you know, oh, they're raping, and the Union soldiers are raping and pillaging me, but I am not an expert. Yes. Hi, Don. Um, I'd like you to describe your research met methods and where you found some of your juiciest stuff. I'm, I'm sorry. Describe your research methods and where you found some of your juiciest uh, items. <laughs> Thank you. I couldn't have written this book 10 years ago. Um, it used to be that, that scholars would spend years and years and travel to libraries around the country. You're asking about research. Yeah. And travel to libraries around the country and camp out there and look at original documents and, and all of that. Um, thank goodness for digitalization. Mm -hmm. um, a lot if not most of the Founding Fathers' papers are on a um, National Archives University of Virginia website called Founders Online. Um, it's really fun to look at, and if you're a teacher, this is a great resource for your kids to get primary sources. Um, every book that's ever been written in the world seems to be on WorldCat, which is You'll, those of you who have hung out in libraries before remember the volumes of the Union catalog that the Library of Congress printed, every book that they had. Well, now it's in an online free database called WorldCat, including the Seattle Public Library and University of Washington, Seattle University, they're all part of that. Um, one 18th century book I wanted to get it was a British translation of a French finance minister pamphlet. So I went online, I saw from WorldCat that the University of Michigan Library had a copy. I went back online to the Seattle Public Library. I filled out an online request for interlibrary loan. And three weeks later, I had in my little hands a 18th century book, just amazing, mm -hmm. just amazing. Um, Five bucks, interlibrary loan. <laughs>
and, and Google um, has digitalized a lot of stuff, as has Internet Archive. Uh, it, this book could not have been written 10 years ago. At least not by me. <laughs> Anything else? Okay. Well, thank you very, very much.